Happy Sabbath. Welcome to worship once again at the University Church here as we continue our series on the book of Job. It's been a, a, uh, an amazing journey for me. Many of you have shared part of your journey in the process of this. And today, we take on a topic, worship, found, sprinkled throughout the book of Job. As we do so, I just would like to share a couple of things so that you understand well, those our family members, how we're navigating through the month of April. Uh, some of us who have been here with regularity, we know April can, it's, it's really, we're heading down a path towards graduation and so on. Are there any seniors among us graduating? In, yeah, okay, some very, very, very laid back seniors, uh, wonderfully well behaved, that's nice. Uh, but we, as we go along, I want you to note, number one, next week, the 17th is our Asian Club weekend and Sabbath. And so we'll have Ridge Garcia, former student here, graduate, pastor, now down in Florida as a guest. And he will be sharing with us for that particular Sabbath. And I just want to say again how much of a delight it is for us as the university church to be home base for our students. And when you're celebrating, we're celebrating. We're so glad and delighted to be able to do that together with you. And then we will finish our sermon series on the book of Job on the 24th with something we're calling Art Sabbath. We've done it once before. We're doing it again, this time kind of COVID uh, safe. We're inviting you to send in any of your artistic responses to God, anything that you do that is art from your perspective, some sort of visual representation of that we would love for you to send in. And of course, we've already received some of your submissions and they range from uh, artistic painting, drawing sort of things. We have a couple of Lego creations. I love that. But please, you think broadly, think deeply as you send something in. You'd be welcome to send in some uh, plated dish that you have created as a part of your artistry. You're welcome to send the dish itself uh, a little earlier to me so that I would have a first-hand kind of a thing to say about that. That would be wonderful. Uh, some of you make furniture. Some of you are gardeners. Some of you sing. Some of you uh, uh, do all sorts of different things, and we would welcome that you would find some little snippet of your creativity, take a photo quick, send it off to us. We'll have decorations that honor our creativity as we understand in the book of Genesis, and it is scattered, the conversation around the creator, creation, and creativity through the book of Job. And in fact, as we touch on worship today, it is one of our great forms of worship to follow the Genesis story and the creator God who said to God, let us make mankind in our image. And so male and female, he made them and immediately gave them a task or two to involve them in the creation process and gave them the power to procreate. It is a calling of mankind to follow God in our creative processes. And so I invite you to consider doing so on that particular Sabbath. And then the following Sabbath, the ultimate Sabbath of, of the year before graduation uh, for our university students, we are inviting our university president that will be retiring shortly after and former senior pastor of this church that preceded me directly, Pastor or Dr. Dave Smith, to take the pulpit and share with us on that particular Sabbath, May 1. The following Sabbath will be graduation. Another thing I wanted you to know about, and there are, there are a couple of reasons, there is a group that has just emerged for a few years now, Carlin Sewell has been grappling with, and we've had conversations around it, her desire to start a small group. And you should know there are a number of different kinds of small groups that you could participate in, but this one is just starting. Uh, the Thursday of April 15 for the first time. And as uh, Carlin shared with me some of what's behind this notion, it's just as she's gone through her spiritual journey, of being a, a, a wife, a young mother with small children on into their adulthood and all of the transitions that take place. She's just found more and more conversations of women in their midlife and, and a little older who are finding similar kinds of realities and maybe spurred on by some of the conversations we've had most recently in the last couple of Sabbaths. But 
uh, even just for quite some time, a desire to do that. So I'm, I'm wanting you to know about this particular small group that you would be free and welcome if you fit that category, a group to provide encouragement for women in mid-season of life to do so. But there's another reason why I'm showing you this, and it's because I see Pastor Tim right over here who is leading our group life in this church, and more and more small groups are growing and bubbling up. It is our and my strong belief that there are about at least three large categories of spiritual health and growth that are really important for us as followers of Jesus. The first is that we have our own personal, private, devotional conversation. You, can, you have to eat for yourself, right? The second, I'll jump, I'll skip one and jump to the other end, is corporate worship. We're going to talk more about that today. But middle to that would be an opportunity to gather with others and share your ideas, ask your questions. You know, we've had some amazing conversations over the last couple of weeks, but it's been fairly monological, even though we have tried to do things to interact, and I share with you the voices of our church members and so on, you don't necessarily get to ask your questions or to try out your own understandings of Scripture and so forth, and that happens best in a small group. There are certain topics that you can only just barely touch on outside of more small group kind of environments, and so maybe God has been scratching at your heart too, just like Carlin shares that he, he has done with her, and you might have some area of interest that you're curious about, well, send a note to church at southern.edu and say, hey, I'm wondering about a group. Is there a group that's involved in this sort of thing? And we'd love to make sure you know about the groups that exist. But it's possible that God is stirring in your heart something that ought to be that isn't. And we would love to talk more with you about that too. Well, we dive into the book of Job. We're going to do uh, something a little differently as we get, be, get, get started here, and that is I'd like to ask you a question or two and have you dialogue with somebody near you. And I know that there are some of us that aren't near anybody. We'll try to at least lock in on some eye contact and ask. If you are a family with small children, this is a perfect time, a perfect activity for you to ask uh, teenagers and so forth. And so here's my first question for you to discuss with somebody near you what is something you have eaten recently that you found particularly delicious? Something yummy, something that was awesome and wonderful. I've got a couple examples I'm going to give, but I'm going to give you a second to just share with somebody near you something you've eaten recently that was especially scrumptious. And look around. If you see somebody that seems a little bit alone, try to look at and pair up a little bit. Share for a second. I'm going to draw you back. All right, all right, somebody may have eaten something so wonderfully delicious that you've, you've hogged all of the time and haven't let anybody else even talk, that could be. But I'm gonna draw you back, I'm gonna draw you back, I'm gonna share with you a couple of things. Firstly, uh, as, as recently as yesterday, as recently as yesterday, I had a bowl of my wife's lentil soup, which sounds like, okay, whatever. But you need to understand two things. One, I love, love, love soups. I could go much of my life eating soup and salad. That would be, that would be a delightful way for me to go through life in, in most days. And my wife makes the best soups, and it's just the right combination of just the vegetables and the different things in it. And then uh, just a splash, Litch, just a splash of Carl's salt, seasoned salt, which is a little bit of a, just as a, a little kick to it and ah oh, wonderful I don't expect you to understand I just need you to know though delightful awesome don't know what you said I, I just mentioned that I also enjoy salads an awful lot and for me I like making big salads and dressing can be a big issue for the salads and uh, some of you who are from the northeast if you would know if you lived around Maryland probably you'd know Lito's Pizza and uh, I love Lido's pizza, but I also just love Lido's salad dressing, their house salad dressing. So anytime somebody, yes, yeah, Shelly, I see your head nodding. Anytime somebody's traveling through that area and that is a family member or a good friend, we, hey, hey, pick up some Lido's salad dressing. And they know we like a lot of it. And 
For some reason, they used to put it in these little kind of pint jars, and now they put them in these little plastic containers. So the last time my daughter was coming through that area, she came back with like six of these plastic containers. They were all over the place. And so Carolyn's brother was coming to visit his mother for her birthday, and we, we kind of said, hey, yeah, yeah, please, pick up some Lido's dressing for us. And we like a lot of it. Dave, I think the, I think the wording was something like, Dave really loves this, and, and he can put it down. So uh, he was in looking to get some of this, and as he was doing so, asking for like six, seven, eight of these plastic containers full, the person serving said, well, you know it's cheaper to just buy a gallon. We sell it by the gallon. Seriously, they sell it by the gallon. So yes, a gallon of Lido's <laughs> salad dressing arrived at our house, and it is awesome. <laughs> All right, I'll shift to another one. I'll invite you into this one as well. Would you think to, for a second, and again, children, teenagers, Young adults, older, all of us, think about this. What's something you saw recently that you found to be especially cute or beautiful? Cute or beautiful? You can think cool, uh, but something that you saw recently that was cute or beautiful? Anything at all. Take a second. Share with somebody around you. So again, let me draw you to a close here. Just yesterday, and some of you still are asking, how are you doing physically, Pastor Dave? If you didn't know, I, I had a little surgery and everything's going great and I'm feeling pretty, pretty good. And yesterday I had the opportunity to play in the Collegedale Academy Golf Tournament for Alumni Weekend and that was just uh, wonderful. And by the way, uh, the day was kind of looking questionable in the weather uh, along the way, like maybe they'd have to be canceled, maybe it wasn't going to be nice weather, but yesterday was spectacular. The weather, I mean seriously, the blue sky, the occasional clouds, as long as you could kind of fight your way through some pollen, <laughs> it was just, what, how many times, I wonder, did I say to somebody else, because of course all the golfers, we had been wondering, is this going to happen or not, and then, then there it was, this beautiful, beautiful, perfect temperature day and to turn to somebody else and say, hey, how about this weather, huh? And every time it would be responded to with some version of gorgeous, awesome, this is perfect. I don't know if you thought of something cute. I'm going to show you a couple of, of pictures. Firstly, this is my uh, daughter Alyssa's dog, Jackson. Jackson uh, loves to be cuddled with and to be petted and will be in situations where he feels like he's being ignored, and so sometimes when that's happening, if he believes you're the one who is wrongfully ignoring him, he will lie down with everything aimed at you. And so I just said, okay, all right, enough is enough. I'm going to do the same thing. And uh, so there's at least one cute thing in that picture. Here's, here's another uh, cute thing. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's universal. This morning, exact same reaction. Oh, that's Lucy the dog and Benji, Enoch and Tracy, our good friends, newborn. And yes, you have the right response. Ah. Oh. Do you know something? Fairly universal to the human experience is the notion of praising. We praise a great salad dressing. You praise a relationship. You will, I will praise the weather, the spectacular Grand Canyon, or the incredible dryness of the desert. We will praise the actions of our children. 
And then this subject of worship comes along, and I just uh, kind of center us here with a couple of definitions that you already surely know. Worship, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion, and praise, to express a favorable judgment of. I'm in favor of that. This is good. This is spectacular. How awesome and wonderful is that? And so in that context, worship and praise, we just fly into our teaching today with Revelation chapter 5 and words surely you know, starting in the 11th verse, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They circled and circled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang out, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever and ever. Lord God, as we dig through your word, teach us something of your character. But right now we pause to say again, glory be, glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, to God Almighty, glory, honor to you. We worship you today. Teach us more. Show us more of yourself. In Jesus we claim it. Amen. And amen. And so, we jump into this subject of worship, both feet, knowing that we are in a sermon series on the book of Job. And if you think back on it, you can recall that this storyline of Job, and it's been an interesting and fascinating, I was just having a conversation with a couple of our team members, just fascinating to me that the, the way that we are exploring the book of Job, it's a little bit like peeling back layer after layer rather than starting in one spot and going a distance, then picking up and going another distance, uh, kind of chapter by chapter. It seems like we have to go backwards and forwards to unpack this incredible teaching in the book of Job so that if we were to start right there in the book of Job in that first chapter, as you recall it, this upright and godly man who worships on occasion by sacrificing to God in, on behalf of his children, concerned that maybe they would have forgotten him in some way. And so somehow, corporately, he is, he is transferring this worship to God on behalf of his children. But a day comes in the middle of the first chapter of the book of Job when, in fact, all of his stuff is destroyed, right? All of his buildings and his home and all of his children's homes and all of the cattle are destroyed and all of the crops are destroyed. In fact, all of his children are destroyed. And we, this all happens in the first, I don't know, 18, 19 vo- uh, verses. And then we get to the 20th verse of the book of Job and it says this, at this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head and then he fell to the ground in worship fell to the ground and worshiped this at such an awkward and difficult time, but you will notice if you pay attention, if you carefully unpeel the book of Job, what you will find at the core, in the center of it all, is not only the desperation, not only the pain, and we've been walking through winter and rest the last two Sabbath teachings to, to find our way through the subjects of anxiety and depression and suicide even, and what this means in the calling of God and the book of Job, and the difficulties. But at the core, at the core, right there beside the difficulties. Remember, it is, it is perfectly accurate and encouraged to tell the truth to God of what you're experiencing, no matter how difficult and how desperate it might be. But to include the continuation of, the completion of your sentences in your life. Don't miss out on finishing the sentences with who God is and what he is doing in your life as a part of who you are so that central to the book of Job is this interesting interweaving of the subject of worship. 
At this time, this desperate, desperate time, Joe got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. He is in full mourning. But in the midst of his grief, then he falls to the ground in worship. And God will say, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Fascinatingly, as we study what happens when people worship, and what are the kind of some of the ingredients and elements of worship? Adoration and praise, and we might sing, we might teach, there'd be prayer, thanksgiving, there is a corporate element to the idea of worship that is involved. You can worship privately, but it's also importantly powerful to worship corporately. I hope you are understanding that. I hope you get to experience that. Some of you are at home right now, but I just really strongly encourage you to seek community for worship because there is something unique that even happens there. But as non-believers, scholars, academicians have studied the subject of worship, they've found some very unique and interesting things. Also true of issues like gratitude, but on the subject of worship specifically, what they find is individuals who worship corporately express an experience of less stress. As we've talked about anxiety, and we've talked about the fact that God blesses us with a variety of ways of meeting us in the midst of our needs, and it might be that a therapist is something God would be using, or a, a physician, even medication. It could be that there are other mindset issues or habits that could be had. There could be forgiveness given or received that could make a huge difference. All sorts of things, but what scholars are telling us, those who don't even believe in this thing that we come here to crack open, they're telling us that we experience less stress than we otherwise would have if we had not come here today to worship. It reminds me a little bit of the atheist kind of suggestion about followership in God whom they do not believe exists, and that is to say, hey, you Christians, I think you're just making something up because it feels good to you. It, it's a kind of a psychological crutch, what they're saying, which actually there's a part of me that goes, okay, so let me unpack what you're saying. What you're saying is that it psychologically assists me to believe in God. Even though you don't believe in him, you can't help but say, I'm better off because I do. Huh. And you instead, maybe you're going for alcohol, even if all you're doing is comparing how much mine costs. Or whatever your habit, whatever your self-medication, whatever your thing is, guess what? You just said, mine's better. You don't have to be a believer to understand and actually notice that. So maybe we as believers should take careful notice. The data shows those who worship corporately live longer. They build better familial and marital relationships. Now, of course, it is true. Your marriage could fall apart while you worship every Sabbath. It is true. But you should know, scholars show there is less anxiety, less depression, and less suicide. So before we go blazing past this on the conversations we've been most recently having, do not forget that one of the miraculous remedies God has for the difficulties we carry in our lives is worship. And in a study in 2019 in Ireland, comparing two groups of people, both of whom believed the same things about God, but they share doctrinal beliefs. One group goes to church or goes to worship corporately, regularly. The other believes the same, but does not go to a corporate worship. They found that the group that goes to corporate worship has, in groups aged 40 to 65 years of age, they were studying had a 55% lower mortality rate. Poof. I mean, and we wonder, COVID and otherwise, will worship corporately continue to matter because we can just watch online. There's something that happens when God's people come together and praise together and worship together. It is a big deal. It is not a small deal. It makes a difference. And Job seems 
to understand this. There's something about the darkness he travels through that worship seems to keep getting inserted, insinuated, and cracking loose. He will worship at his most down crest fallen moments, like learning that all of your children are gone. And he will mourn, but he will worship. Could it be this is a part of the secret of his following through, not only getting through parts of chapter 1, but 2, 5, 20, chapter 19, we'll see in a minute, all the way to chapter 42 where the book ends, for it is only at the very end that he hears the voice of God he has been calling after so consistently. But this Job will say in the 42nd chapter after hearing this, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. And you asked, you God asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Lord God, you are beyond my imaginings. You are more wonderful than I can even give voice to. It's like a day you thought was going to rain and you weren't going to get to golf and then it turns out to be perfect. And lentil soup with a cute newborn baby and everything amazing. Interestingly, this journeyer friend of ours, Job, doesn't just worship at the beginning and at the end. But you will find even amidst his gut-wrenching concerns. Moments, we've seen some of them before. This one maybe in particular, squarely halfway through the story of this tortured soul. He will call out, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end he will stand upon the earth. I know my Redeemer lives. We've been challenging you. If you have a difficult story you're living through, finish the sentence like Job. I can't make sense of what's going on with me. And in fact, everything I try seems to fail. And I am a failure. That may be what you feel. Finish the sentence. But I know my Redeemer lives and it pushes us to our knees. It pushes us to a place of adoration and praise and worship. And even atheistic scholars will confess that you and I will be better off because of it. So what better thing to do as we glance through the 10th chapter, 12th verse, he says, you gave me life and showed me kindness. This is in the midst of the storyline, in the midst of the problems. And in your providence, you've watched over my spirit. This worshiper, what better place to go than to the one place we can find where Jesus teaches on the subject of worship? The one place, it's in John chapter 4. It starts in verse 4 of John 4, saying that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, anybody who would be a Jew at that time would have said, no, 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 you have to not go through Samaria. You will be ritually unclean. This is not what we would do. No, that's not it. But geographically, it looks like the straight route from the south to the north. But all of the Jews would go around Samaria. You don't go through Samaria. Jesus had to go through Samaria. And as you read the story, you can start to tell he had to go through Samaria because of the person he would meet. And that is what is true about this God. He has to go places because he will not let go of you. He chases you through the streets, the back alleys, the hiding places, and the darkness to go to be where you and I are. So he had to go to Samaria and sits down by a well. She comes at an unusual time for anybody drawing water, the heat of the day, but you know a little bit about her story and there's some shame in it and he asks her some questions and she kind of bobs and weaves a little bit only to be exposed by this now known prophet who will say, yeah, you've answered correctly for the five that were your husband are now gone and you're living with somebody who is not your husband. Eesh. Precisely why I came at this time of day is not to have to stare that in the face. And here you are, Jesus, confronting me with this. And so the woman seems to bob and weave just a little bit further, changes quickly the subject. 
you find it in the midway through there. Jesus has just said in the 18th verse, the fact is you have had five husbands and the man you're now with is not your husband, so you've said the correct thing. And she says, well, sir, I can see that you're a prophet, so let me ask you a completely different question that will go some other direction, please. And she asks this question. She says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, here's what you need to understand, a little backstory here. You have the Jewish nation, you have the Israelites, you have the Samaritans, they split off from this same group much, much earlier. And in fact, they believe in the books of Moses. The first five books of our Bible, the books of Moses, but they do not believe in the remainder of the Old Testament. So that the, the Jews believe all of the, the, the prophets and the kings and the stories of the that were, that were told, but they both share the same understanding of the books of Moses. Well, almost. Not exactly. Example. In Genesis chapter 22, there's the story of Abraham being called by God to take his son Isaac and go and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah, a three days journey. And in fact, it is on Mount Moriah, supposedly at the same place that he was to offer sacrifice of Isaac, on that very place is where the temple for the, for in Jerusalem was built, Mount Moriah, the same place. At least that's what you would understand if you were a Jew. If you're a Samaritan, the story gets told differently. Their reading, the way they would have, and what a good Jew would say is the way they have rewritten these books of Moses in Genesis chapter 22 is to say that in fact, this all occurred not on Mount Moriah, this occurred at Mount Gerizim which is where she stands. And she asks the question, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but the Jews, you say that the place where we must worship is on that mountain, which is it? Now, by the way, if you're kind of cornered in a moment of your own shame, what a gifted and thoughtful way to redirect the whole thing is to bring up a controversy with somebody who you know will be on the other side of the controversy. Bait them, hook them and draw them in. And so she asks Jesus this question, which Jesus is going to give her a very surprising response and a surprising answer. But in the midst of it, I want to reread this again and then I want to stop and ask a question of you. So our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is on that mountain in Jerusalem. We say Gerizim. You say Mount Moriah. Samaria. Jerusalem. And my question to you, is do you have worship mountains that you argue over? For Jesus will say in just a moment, you've got it all wrong. It's not about the mountain. A time will come when the mountain, yeah, yeah, yeah. Salvation comes through the Jews. Tip of the cap to Mount Moriah. But the mountain is not what matters. So I don't have any mountain. I don't have any particular place. You don't? You don't have a place where you're willing to worship and other places where you're not? I've heard some people refer, and we, we, we're really gifted about how we do these sorts of things. I heard one person talk about a church in our community, a Seventh-day Adventist church in our community, and they called it the Smoke and Mirrors Church. See, because that's not my mountain. I believe in this mountain. Is your mountain the one with the organ or the one with the trap set? Because I've heard both mountains cherished as what worship is about. And Jesus would say, you, you have it all wrong. If you must have a trap set to worship, you're not worshiping in the first place. If you must have the organ to worship, you're not worshiping in the first place. If you have to have gospel music to worship, you're not worshiping. If you have to have orchestral music, high church music, if you have to be in pews, you're not worshiping. If you have to be in movable seating, you're not worshiping. If you have to have a suit and a tie on you and everybody else, you're not worshiping. If you have to have jeans and a t-shirt, you're not worshiping. If you were to say, I'm not coming back to worship until we can sing. Enough of this humming. 
That's fine. Just admit that's a personal taste issue, though. And when we commingle our personal tastes as if that mountain is required for worship, Jesus would say, no, no, time is coming and actually has now come where it will not matter what the mountain is. It does not matter what the music is. It does not matter who the speaker is. Have you ever been somewhere and you ask, hey, so what's going on this, this particular Sabbath at, at church? And somebody says, well, I'm not going because this person's speaking or because it's Pathfinder Sabbath or because it's... And I apologize if I'm getting really close to toes. I, I'm not thinking of anybody in particular. And so if I, in these next couple of moments or in the previous, quote you, I apologize. I'm not thinking that I am. It's a collage of things that have swirled around me over time. I, had, uh, I don't even remember who, but I had an interaction with somebody between our adoration and our renewal services. And as the person had come out of our adoration service where we are much more high church and we enjoy the classical music and, and we enjoy the hymns in, we're right out here and a group of students are practicing and kind of just making sure the sound levels and so on, getting ready for the renewal service. And an individual says to me, well, you want to know why I'm never going to renewal? That's why. And they point at the, at the electronic trap set. Not lost on me at all was the fact that the very next Sabbath, and I glanced, yep, they're here. The very next Sabbath, there was a special music in adoration that was moving and amazing, and it was accompanied by a background trap, a track, and trap. So it's not even the mountain of not having the trap, it's the mountain of not seeing it. had a conversation with somebody who was moving their membership and I really would just encourage you, please be in a corporate setting where you find community that you can engage in. And so I would never begrudge that at all. But a good friend of mine and a person who I know appreciates what I'm doing and, and I like them, shared, just fell out of respect. They wanted to let me know why they were moving their membership. And part of what they said was, I just, we, I just, have, to be, I just have to be able to go to church. And it, this was late fall, and I found myself saying, but we've been having church since June 13. Of course, a good stretch of that time, it was outside in multiple services. So maybe your mountain is that it has to be inside, can't be outside. Maybe your mountain is that if you ask me to wear a mask, I cannot possibly worship. Well, then all of your worship is out here. And that's not Jesus' definition of worship. Do you have a mountain? Could you, like the persecuted church, Christian church of China, could you go to worship where it must be absolutely silent the entire time for fear of persecution? so that a message is somehow communicated out that we are now singing this particular hymn and they in hundreds to thousands in silence mouth the words and we are stuck on whether we have to hum or sing. I'm going to suggest to you that if my wearing a suit or you wearing jeans are an inhibition to your or my capacity to worship, I have no confidence we're going to make it through any kind of persecution. If seeing the trap set is the most dangerous thing that we could do to you, <laughs> spiritually, then a time is coming. Maybe has now come. Now, we may not make it through. Do you have a mountain? Some molehill that you've turned into a mountain, a mountain you're ready to die on that isn't Mount Calvary? <laughs> it's fairly normal of us. Jesus says, believe me. Believe me, woman. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Uh, as if to say you're asking the wrong question. 
But instead, he begins to point her to this simple idea that worship is something that happens in spirit and in truth. So let's break that down. What does it mean to worship in spirit? That means, and by the way, some translations say worship in the spirit, and then it'll be a capitalized S for spirit. I should have written it that way for you. The Holy Spirit. But in fact, the Greek doesn't have the article, ho. So it is your spirit. You are to worship from your spirit. That's from something that others cannot see. That's from something inside this jacket, inside this shirt, behind this tie, deep in here. You are to worship in authenticity and reality, and boy, isn't it true, because you know it for yourself. You could just simply compare. Sometimes you've worshiped and know, this time over here, I was authentic, and I was real, and I was wholehearted. This time over here, I just had a person who is a shell that has a good voice. Because Jesus would say, yeah, you can be all whitewashed up. You can be all dressed up. You can be all quaffed. Love that word. and yet be an empty tomb of spirituality. And in Malachi chapter one, he would say, if you are going to give me something less than the most of all of you from your heart, 100%, your best, all of it, authentic, true worship from in your spirit, not just on your face, not just on your threads, Malachi 1, he says, I would rather we shut the temple doors than to accept those kinds of worship offerings. Because you're just faking, we're just playing around, playing a game that means nothing to me. Some of you are hearing scolding in my voice. You should also be hearing pleading and blessing Because some of you have felt, I don't have a great voice, I don't have really delightful clothing, I don't have the right background, I don't know everything, but I'm going to challenge you, you have exactly what it takes to worship God. The full-hearted choice of your spirit. But Jesus doesn't just say spirit, does he? He also adds the word truth. You can worship full-heartedly and worship the wrong thing. And in fact, Paul suggests we are in a battle over where we are going to place glory. That you every day, it's not will you worship. The actual question is, what will you worship? You can worship yourself wholeheartedly. You can worship your depression wholeheartedly. You can worship your successes, the thing you hope for, what your children do athletically, you can worship wholeheartedly. But Jesus says, in spirit and in truth, after he has, in fact, talked for just a second about this notion that the Samaritans don't know where salvation comes from, but the Jews do, and he goes on to say, and it has now come. And he will say in the 23rd and 24th verses, yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And this is concerning to her, and she attempts a shift again by saying, I know that the Messiah, called the Christ, is coming, and so when he comes, we'll ask him. And Jesus says, good plan. Here I am. In spirit, and in truth. I will tell you, it's one of the reasons I feel so strongly about teaching from God's word in a part of our corporate worship times. I don't feel actually uh, uh, strongly that any one thing has to always be a part of worship. I'd be fine if we had a time when it was safest and best for us to be listening to music because we couldn't sing. I'd be dissatisfied if that were our constant and forever state. I would be okay if we had a worship service that was completely musical, of course. But the teaching, the truth part, is a big and important part of this deal. And then, and then there's this little thing that I wanted to share with you as we close. And, 
and it's maybe something you've never thought about, maybe it's something that you've never been concerned over, or maybe it is. I, I find that people who walk away from Jesus tend to think this sort of thing. Maybe it's because they're actually now building the arguments for why it's good that they walk away from Jesus. I'm not actually certain about this, but have you ever wondered about, well, let me just put it this way. Let's pretend that when you came to church today, you were handed a card on the way in with a list of appropriate kinds of greetings for which, with which you should greet me. And they'd, they'd be things like, say, I, Pastor Dave, you're the best preacher I've ever listened to. And you wear that suit really well. <laughs> you know, whatever. How weird would it be to be given a list of, or to be demanded or required that you, when you greet me, that you praise me? You would be thinking, wow, how, what kind of a glory hound is that? How big-headed is this person? Maybe, maybe just downright narcissistic. Everything's about them. And those who are not believers, every once in a while will ask, what is this thing with this God of yours who demands your worship all the time, who says you've got to keep telling me how good I am? Come on, come on. If you're, otherwise, get out. Give me your best. I get everything. Mm. And in digging around in this question mark, I've found an additional beautiful truth that I just want to leave you with. Yes, it is true that this is the God who in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 will say, as he's giving the Ten Commandments, worship no other gods, I am a jealous God. And there are places where we can listen to what is shared about our, our requirement of worship that can sound like a, a kind of a narcissistic calling out of us, but, but, here are some important points to keep in mind. Number one, we already talked about the fact that we benefit from worship. We are actually made to run on the fuel of worship. You are healthier when you worship. Additionally, worship and glory is a part of our daily battle. In fact, this God of truth will say through Paul's words in Romans 1.25, for they, he's talked about it a couple different ways here in Romans 1, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. You're in a daily contest with where you're going to put your praise. And some of us will praise or heighten or lift up very negative things in our lives. Others of us, very positive things, but we will shift, if we're not careful, the glory that belongs to God. Still, is he just full of himself? And for this question, I want to just read you, show you a quote from C.S. Lewis. Again, you already know I'm, 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 I check in with C.S. Lewis every once in a while. Reflections on the Psalms is a book that he wrote, and here he says this. The most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, strangely, for so long escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or the giving of honor. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise unless shyness or the fear of boring others is deliberately brought into, brings it into check. The world rings with praise. Lovers praise their mistress. Readers, their favorite poet. Walkers praise the countryside. Players praising their favorite game. A praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles. Even sometimes politicians or scholars. I had not noticed how the humblest and at the same time most balanced and capacious minds praised the most, while the cranks, the misfits, and malcontents praise the least. And except where intolerably adverse conditions or circumstances interfere, praise almost seems to be the inner health made audible. And if you're struggling with inner health, Grab onto some praise of God and repeat it even when it's hard to feel it. Worship, even when you've shaven your, your head in mourning, figuratively speaking. For praise might just well be inner health made audible. 
Lewis says, I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Isn't it glorious? Don't you think that magnificent? Isn't this a beautiful day for a golf tournament? The psalmist, in telling everyone to praise God, are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. My whole and more general difficulty about the praise of God depended on an absurdly denying, on my absurdly denying to us as regards the supremely valuable what we delight to do, what we indeed can't help doing about everything else we value. What he's saying here is, I had this ab absurd insistence on denying that we could praise the one thing most worthy of it when that's our natural instinct to do of almost everything. Maybe we're just built for praise. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses it, but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. And God calls us to praise him. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment and it is its appointed consummation. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is complete is incomplete, sorry, the delight is incomplete until it is expressed. And I love you well met makes the I love you full and fuller still. If it were possible for a created soul fully to appreciate that is to love and delight in the worthiest object of all and simultaneously at every moment to give this delight perfect expression, then that soul would be in supreme beatitude, or another word for happiness. And he reminds us, the Scotch Catechism says that, the, that man's chief end is to glorify God, and sometimes we will stop it there, that you are called to glorify God, but this, this particular teaching goes on to say to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. You're called to joy, to fullness, Rejoice in the Lord that your joy would be full. That we shall then know that these are the same thing. Fully to enjoy is to glorify. In commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting you, inviting me, inviting us to enjoy him. For it will always stop just a little bit short without glorifying God. It'll stop way short if we turn that glory to something else that is not deserving. It'll stop way short if you or I choose to take what is meant for a moment of glorifying God and make a mountain out of some molehill issue and turn that to the thing that we praise and worship. And it could be the day of the week. It could be the thing that we eat or that we don't. And so we end with these praises I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in robes of righteousness, or as Job would say, I know. No matter what I've lost, no matter the boils on my skin, no matter that I want to die, I know my Redeemer lives. I hope you know this Jesus. I hope he is a part of your life. And I encourage you to enter into the fullness of the joy that only comes as you praise his name. So bow with me. Lord God, thank you so, so, thank you so much for your presence here, for the opportunity to come. We don't even understand all you've given us in this moment of worship. But we are filled with conviction that it's not because of the sound of a preacher's voice. It's not because of the clinking of, of a piano. It is because you are here and you are good 
and you are our redeemer, and you are alive, and you are rescuing us. You are mid-rescue of us. And so we proclaim the song of the redeemed. And we pledge to live redeemed lives this week in worship of you. In the name of Jesus, amen.